Well, hello, everyone. Super Tuesday is here. I'm Chris Thomas. We've got our phones. We've got our laptops. The numbers are coming in. Yeah, huh? we are ready to reveal those results as they start coming in. I'm Laura Painter. Thank you for joining us. Super Tuesday, just like that. Voters going to the polls in 15 states, including right here in California, the Republican prime presidential primary. Nikki Haley promising to stay in the race through tonight. And here in California, listen to this, we sadly could break the record for the lowest turnout ever in a primary election. Analysts say voters are not excited about a possible Joe Biden and Donald Trump rematch. I read an article yesterday where it said this is one of the finest run campaigns that anybody has ever seen. That's pretty good, right? That's pretty good. It's really a statement. And we have no choice because November 5th, it's right around the corner, November 5th is going to go down as the single most important day in the history of our country. And we're going to make America great again, greater than ever before. So take a look. The results are coming in. And there you see Donald Trump leading with more than 77% of the vote. As a matter of fact, the AP has already called it for Donald Trump here in California. Joe Biden, they've also called 93% so far. And tonight, I have to tell you, we do have two political experts in with us tonight in the studio. Nathan Barankin is former chief of staff to then Senator Kamala Harris. And Tamika Hamilton, a former U.S. Air Force sergeant who challenged Congressman John Garamendi in 2020 and 2022. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for being here on this busy primary election night. As these results are starting to come in, give us some of your initial thoughts. Nathan, we'll start with you. Well, it is impressive that Nikki Haley won yet another jurisdiction. D.C., not the, the, the district, was the first one, but she claimed Vermont tonight, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is going to mean something for purposes of her own deliberations about what her next step is. And what we do know is that in these Republican primaries, while Donald Trump is rolling consistently with huge victories, there is a solid segment of the Republican Party that doesn't want to support him. And where they're going to go come November is anyone's guess. Mm -hmm. And Tamika, what kind of signal does that send for the Republican Party? I think that we already know that uh, Donald Trump is going to secure this nomination. And, you know, I think that, you know, we have a lot of time between now and November, so we could possibly see a victory for him. But again, there's a lot of time between now and November. We started off talking about the turnout, right? right. And that perhaps voters were turned off. Right. by the fact that they may be heading toward another rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. What do you think that says with the turnout being the way it is here in California? I mean, you know, these are two candidates that honestly both sides did not want. And these are not the choices that I think that Americans deserve. But here we are. So at the end of the day, uh, you're going to have your true diehard high propensity voters that are going to show up. Um, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to get both of them, you know, over the edge for November. And Nathan, I have to ask you, as we look at these turnout numbers, I think the lowest was somewhere around 30, 31 percent. Uh, we could be lower than that. What does that say about how the uh, voters feel about these candidates? Well, I think I agree with Tamika 100 um, percent. These are two leading candidates. Eff effectively, they're both incumbent presidents mm -hmm. for purposes of their own party. And in re-election years in California, for sure, turnout is anemic in those re-election years for Democrats, for Democrats, for sure. But they're also both not terribly popular. Right. So it's hard to get the excitement level up. I think that's likely to change, though, for November. What are some of your concerns for the down-ballot races as the enthusiasm for the presidential races are somewhat lackluster, let's say? Well, one of the things that we know from some of the analysis that has been done of early returns that came in um, uh, prior to Election Day is that the electorate is predominantly older and predominantly white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what that means and the impact of that is that those are the people who are going to have a disproportionate say on what the voters' choices will be in November. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have to tell you that there are also some local things that are on the ballot, including Prop 1, if we can take a look at some of the results there. There you see, I mean, this is still very early. This is Prop 1 that would give $6 billion to try and tackle 
homeless issues, also mental health issues here in California. The no's are winning, but still very early here. I also think we have the Senate results as well, if we can uh, look at those, because this is another big race, Laura. Yes, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. So we're seeing Adam Schiff here with 34 percent and Steve Garvey, a Republican opponent, at 31 percent. Let's talk with our guests here and branch this out. This is the seat to fill the late Senator Dianne Feinstein. It's on the ballot twice. I wonder if that's a little bit confusing for voters as they're seeing that there. Um, let's toss it over to Tamika. What are some of your thoughts? Do you think that we could get a Democrat Republican uh, race going on here? Uh, well, we have a jungle primary, of course, but could it be the top two out there, Schiff and Garvey? Did yes, it, it was very unexpected. You know, mm -hmm. when I saw that Adam Schiff was uh, you know, doing all that he can to raise uh, Garvey's name ID. I did not think that they were going to be in a dead heat, but here we are. So, you know, anything could happen. Uh, so I do believe that we could possibly have a Republican and Democrat for the first time in a long time. Would that surprise you? It would not, based on how the campaign has been run. I, should, I need to disclose <laughs> I was a tremendous advocate for Barbara Lee uh -huh. um, in this particular race. Mm -hmm. With these early returns, she's not doing very well and we have a long way to go to figure mm -hmm. out what the actual results are going to be in california it's not going to be tonight in this particular right. race it'll be a while to go but yes adam schiff invested heavily yes. in elevating steve garvey and looks like at least based on the early returns he's getting a return on that investment yeah. mm -hmm. okay well while we're talking about this race let's take a closer look at the voting county by county tonight our brandon Ritterman has what's he's following tonight brandon there's a lot of races going on in this primary election. What are you seeing right now? Yeah, so we're just starting to see county results trickle in, even though, as you pointed out, the presidential race has already been called um, for both parties here in California by the Associated Press. They do that on projections, which I won't get into all the machinations of how that works. But I actually want to take a look back real quick because we were talking about the antipathy here. And it's just worth remembering that the last time Joe Biden was on a ballot here in our primary, Bernie Sanders actually walked away with California uh, as a victory for himself. So uh, on the Republican side, uh, oh, whoop, is that, this is, uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at the Democratic results coming in. We actually have quite a bit more counties uh, coming in. Obviously, no surprise here, Joe Biden's the incumbent. We have a quasi incumbent uh, in Donald Trump, uh, and you can see he's uh, off to a very handy lead. So it's, it's not difficult for the Associated Press to make a call. Uh, we have uniform color on the map, and uh, that actually on the Republican side, I was about to point out, uh, mirrors what we saw in 2016, where Trump handily walked away uh, with California at that stage in the race at that time. We can go ahead and pop over to the Senate race. You'll notice some of the counties uh, were getting staggered results here. Um, but yeah, if we take a look, you can actually see uh, some ideological uh, uh, shift here, which is pretty much going along you know, the, uh, the urban-rural divide, at least according to the map as we see it right now. And then um, we don't yet have any of these trickling in from Prop 1. I'm interested to watch this map throughout the evening as those results come in because I want to see uh, whether we have an urban-rural split uh, on this question. Uh, one of the interesting things about Prop 1 is it's, uh, it's a vote in favor of dedicating a lot more money to the mental health system. It makes some changes to it, but, you know, you could look at this prop in a couple of ways. Is it a referendum on the quality of the mental health care system that we have in California? And are people uh, a little antithetical to wanting to pile more money into a system they might view as broken, for instance? Or are people seeing it as underfunded and wanting to come up with some extra funds for it? So uh, Prop 1 will be interesting to parse. Uh, we've been explaining that to you over the last couple of we uh, weeks. It's a, it's a rather complex question, and it's entirely possible you'll see a lot of undervoting on this question. Uh, people just simply skipping it because they throw up their hands and say, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so I, I'll be watching turnout numbers over the next couple of days pretty carefully as well. Well, when you talk about $6 billion, Brandon, for a prop, I mean, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And especially in this case, when you're talking about mental health, of course, though, when you're driving into work every day, going to the grocery store, it's hard to miss some of the mental health challenges that we say, see when it comes to the homeless crisis. Exactly. Millions and billions of dollars have been thrown at this problem. People want to see results. We'll see if Prop 1 is something that people support and vote on. And we're waiting for those results to come in on a, on a, a massive problem. We got the homeless crisis and mental health crisis here in the state. So it's definitely one to watch as lawmakers try to find solutions for it. I think we want to get now 
to our Andy Judson, who is out in the field. Those polls have closed tonight, mm -hmm. but we're trying to get those results in slowly but surely. Andy is in Sacramento County. So, Andy, talk to us. I know you're getting a behind-the-scenes look at this whole process, and you're learning something about folks who have perhaps received multiple ballots? Yeah, Chris and Laura, whether you voted in person by mail or by that ballot drop box for my Sacramento County voters, your ballot ends up right here in the building. And so um, when it comes here, you'll take a Sorry for one second. There we go. Um, and when it comes here, uh, you'll see that it comes if you're voted by ballot drop box, you'll see it comes right back here. This is where it comes. These fine folks here, everyone cheered right when the 8 p.m. hit. So the ballot stopped, but then they got right to work. You can see they sorted all of these ballots over here to the left so quickly that they're waiting for those next batches to come in. But we have heard we have one report of people receiving multiple ballots. So we talked with our Sacramento County elections official Ken about that. Take a listen. We've heard of people receiving multiple ballots. Why is that? So there are a variety of reasons somebody might receive more than one ballot. They could change their voter registration in some way. They could change their address and uh, maybe they received their ballot when it went out on February 5th and then they move uh, and they get a new, uh, change their address, they get a new ballot at their new address. Um, if they are a no party preference voter and they wanted to vote in one of those uh, parties or one of those primaries that doesn't allow crossover voting like the Republican Party or the Green Party, um, they that would also initiate a change they'd receive another ballot so there are a few reasons why somebody might receive more than one ballot and so if you receive more than one ballot does that mean that you can vote more than one time it absolutely does not one person one vote you can only cast your ballot once so don't try to vote twice mm -hmm. and can you speak to why people can't vote twice even if it's maybe the same signature so the first ballot that we receive um, that matches your signature is the ballot that gets counted And so for the most recent Sacramento County voter turnout, we're at 21%. So far, ballots that have been come in and voted are counted are about 187,000. But again, it's a long night ahead for the elections workers here. A lot of them said they came in around 7, 6 a.m. this morning, and they're going to be here till midnight or even the early morning hours, making sure that your vote is counted as well as in the days to come. For now, we'll send it back to you, Chris and Laura. That's right, Andy. It could take days to certify these results that have come in uh, through the mail-in ballot. So it'll take a while before we really get to get those final answers there. Um, we want to get now to our Becca Habiger, who has been tracking the Sacramento, the Sacramento mayoral race as well. And then we have Jeannie Wynn, too. But let's start with Becca. She's at a watch party, I believe, for Dr. Flo Kofer. Yeah, Laura, you know, a lot of excited supporters here for Dr. Flo Kofer or Dr. Flo as she goes by. That's despite the fact that just a few minutes ago with 12% of the ballots returned and counted, at least in the results, the initial results, uh, we're seeing Flo Kofer is squarely in fourth place at this point. Uh, the top three, Dr. Pan, Steve Hansen, and Kevin McCarty are all within 300 votes of each other. Flo Kofer is more than 1,000 votes apart from the third place person. But again, as Andy mentioned, it's still very early in the night. You know, this all kicked off with Dr. Flo, this whole mayoral race, because she was the first candidate uh, to declare her candidacy. That was back in April. Now this public health professional joins three others as the top front runners. She joins former Sacramento City Council member Steve Hansen, current Assembly member Kevin McCarty, and former State Senator Dr. Richard Pan. The other two candidates are U.S. Marine Corps Captain and Personal Trainer Jose Antonio Avina II and Asset Protection Manager Julius Engel. Now this afternoon I spoke with current Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg. He and political analysts I spoke with say the top two vote getters who will go on to the November election could be any combination likely of the four front runners. Here's how Mayor Steinberg breaks it all down. You know one candidate for mayor is calling for fundamental change in the direction of the city um, and towards a more progressive side and it'll be interesting to see how Dr. Kofer does. Uh, there are other candidates who are, again, backed by the business community. One in particular, uh, former council member Hansen. Senator Pan has a little bit of that profile as well. 
um, who are saying that uh, you know, some of the views of the business community in terms of homelessness and other issues, that must be the, the policy of the city. You have Assemblymember McCarty, who brings an array of experience from the legislature, who I, I think is, I would describe him as more center-left. He emphasized the fact that Sacramento's form of government council manager means the mayor's vote is just one among nine. He says while the mayor can set the tone and be the face of the city, it ultimately takes consensus among a majority of council members to get things done. So Mayor Steinberg is also closely watching the races of the open council districts too. Now we have team coverage on Sacramento's mayoral race. ABC 10's Luke Clary and I are covering the various watch parties throughout the city as candidates see the results roll in. You know, keep in mind with four front runners and with uh, predicted lower votes, Voter turnout. We'll find out about those numbers shortly. Uh, it really could be anyone's race at this point. Uh, those top two vote getters, we might not know until some of the mail in ballots dropped in those blue post office boxes today and yesterday finally arrive at the county and the county poll workers count those. So again, we could know the top two vote getters in the mayoral candidates race tonight if the split is very far. But uh, at this point, I'm looking at the results that just came in. Richard Pan is in first place. Uh, Steve Hans is in second place. Kevin McCarty's in third place. And again, they are all within 300 votes of each other. And only 12% of those ballots are, are included in these results. So there's a lot more uh, to watch with this race coming up. We'll be watching it closely and bring you the latest results tonight at Late News Tonight at 11. Our Becca Hubbegger live for us tonight. We'll check back in throughout the evening. Keep in mind, nine candidates are running to replace former city council member Sean Lalowey in District 2. You may remember he was forced to step down. Our Jeannie Wynn is following that race for us tonight and joins us live with the latest. Hey, Jeannie. Chris, right now we are at Roger Dickinson's watch party and bear with me, it is loud here, but I'm going to step out of the way so you can take a look now. It is very full here. We're at a local bar off of Del Paso Boulevard. There's a lot of people here supporting uh, Dickinson. We've even seen some current sitting council members. Council member Katie Maple was here, uh, Mai Vang, as well as Karina Talamantes. You know, and just moments ago, as uh, the polls closed, uh, his campaign was looking at the early results. And so far, Roger Dickinson is is in the lead with the most votes at this moment. He did give a little speech to his uh, supporters here, here at this bar, thanking them and, you know, honestly just being very excited and, and looking forward to the future and being very hopeful that this will turn out in his favor. As you can see now, he's just talking to Council Member Katie Maple. Uh, a lot of his uh, constituents and supporters, business owners are here supporting him. Again, there are nine people running for this seat, though, so uh, it is still very very early, even though uh, Roger Dickinson is in the lead right now, it's still early. Uh, we did talk to some of the other candidates earlier today. We went to a watch party for Kim Davey, Penelope Larry, and uh, Ramona Landeros. Again, all of them very hopeful and um, confident going into tonight. But you know, we will continue to take keep track of this race and keep you updated as those results continue to come in, Chris and Laura. Yeah, Jeannie, the night's still young, hope's still high, still a lot of excitement at those watch parties. Thank you. We want to bring in now our political experts back in tonight. We have Nathan and Tamika. Yeah, Super Tuesday will bring us closer to identifying the two candidates who will battle for president in November. And you know what? It has not been a great secret, has it, who those two <laughs> people might be. It's all but certain who mm -hmm. they will be again in November. So what advantages do you think each of them have? We'll start with you this time. Well, I think that, of course, the current President Biden has the incumbent advantage. And I think that, you know, former President Trump could come in and uh, capitalize on some of the failures of this current administration. Mm, failures, she says, huh, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, is, that is typically how it is portrayed in an election year, yes. Um, no, I, I, and I agree. I mean, it, um, candidates, certainly when you are the quote-unquote challenger, you're going to criticize the incumbent for everything that has gone wrong, regardless of whether the incumbent is responsible or not. I would say this, though. I think Joe Biden has two tremendous assets working for him going into this November election. One is he is not Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a known quantity. And as pointed out in uh, Nikki Haley's continuing to slog away in these primaries, even though Trump is going to secure the nomination and continuing to secure a good chunk of the Republican vote, there's a, there's a group of voters out there who, are le who lean Republican, a registered Republican, who are not happy with their choice mm -hmm. in Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Second thing is, 
important social issues, issues like a woman's right to choose, are on the side of Joe Biden, with a, particularly with a demographic that are going to be perhaps on the fence about whether they want to support Joe Biden because maybe they think he's too old, maybe he hasn't done what they expected on the economy, but on an, an important social issue like that, it is something that can tip the balance in certain segments of certain states within the nation that could tip the scales for Joe Biden come November. I just want to drill down on that really quickly, and then I want to talk about what do you think some of their disadvantages might be. We talked about advantages. Uh, the age question, right? right. Uh, neither one of these are, as we used to say in Alabama, spring chickens. You know what I mean? <laughs> they are, right. you know, right. they are seasoned gentlemen. Uh, how big of a deal do you think age will be in the race? I think age, I think age will be an issue. I don't think it'll be the top issue. I mean, obviously, we see what's happening with uh, the current president. Uh, Biden and, you know, some of the gaps he's made and, you know, how feeble and weak he looks when he's out on the trail right now. Um, and then you have on the other side, you know, uh, former President Trump, um, you know, while he is well in age as well, also, uh, he's just, you know, still taken away. So, I, but I think the top issue is really going to be, as Nathan said, the social issues um, when it comes down to it. And so then you think that the advantage is Democrats? I think so. I think so. Um, at the end of the day, Republicans have not done a really great job in addressing some of the social issues, a lot of the social issues that are polling right now, uh, uh, for example, abortion, you know. Mm -hmm. Which leads us into the question about disadvantages, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I wanted to have, let Nathan have a chance to respond there. And the next question I had would be the economy mm -hmm. as well, which is uh, something that the Republicans tend to poll uh, very well in. Yes. Um, and as far as the advantages on the Democrat side, do you like to address? Well, I, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, I think Joe Biden's primary advantage is that he is not Donald Trump. He clearly has disadvantages, though, going into this. Election. And that's what we were talking about, yeah, the right. disadvantages. Yeah. yeah, and his yeah. his disadvantages, I mean, obviously, he is old. He would be the oldest president of the United States in, the, in this history. nation's history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I agree with Tamika, this election, you know, I was watching some commentary, as we mentioned earlier um, tonight, there's a, a, a preordained outcome that we have, Trump versus Biden in mm -hmm. the November general election. It's also known that most voters are not really, they prefer someone else. They couldn't necessarily identify who that person mm -hmm. would be, but they would prefer someone else. On the other hand, there will be people who need to make difficult choices. One person said this is a little bit crude, said, I might throw up a little bit in my mouth if I have to vote for the person that, you know, I was, uh, uh, that is the member of the other party. I can't remember whether Republican or Democrat. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It's true on both sides. This shows you the visceral reaction yeah. that the people visceral have. visceral reaction. And that's why I agree with Tamika. It will ultimately come down to issues. And so things like the economy, things like the border, those are relevant to Joe Biden. He needs to get correct on that between now and November in order to make yes. that a winning issue. You think the border could be a disadvantage for Joe Biden? It could be a yes. disadvantage for Joe Biden. But Both of them it, have just recently been down there right. to show but an effort late. that we care about it. But, it, but too late, I think, mm. especially when we're talking about how the border has been a big issue for years and we're looking for someone to fix it or even, you know, do some reform and, and talk about it in a way where it's not the same talking points same, you know, and then when election year comes, oh, all of a sudden we want to go take the pictures and do the photo ops. You know, Americans also seeing where the economy and then you have people coming across the border, regardless of the situation of why they're coming here, they're seeing resources being directed towards them and they're hurting financially. Mm -hmm. So that I do believe is going to be a hot topic for, for November. Right, because we have seen immigration also steep into non-border states as well, into yes. other big cities like yes. New York and even Martha's Vineyard as well. Right, so it's right, very Chicago, Chicago. And you see mm -hmm. city council, you know, people come to city council and making comment and saying, w we've had issues for so long and then, uh, then all of a sudden this influx of new people come in and then things are done very quickly and overnight to support them. Seems to me, though, it's becoming a political football, right? Like, hey, you said this, you did that. We have mm. this bipartisan bill that we're trying to pass. You know, uh, Trump, tell your folks to get out and vote for this bill that we've <laughs> done. You know, and Trump saying, hey, you put me back in there and I'm going to deport or do these types of things. It's almost a political football at this point. Mm. So I agree with you. I would only quibble with one thing, and that is it has not become one. It it's has always been, been one, one yeah. for mm -hmm. quite yes. some time. Now, 
I will say though, it, and that's to our collective disadvantage mm -hmm. that has become that. Um, and I, I, would, I need to know that Joe Biden, one of his very first bill proposals, Steve Miller was talking about this on Fox News the other day, but one of his very first bill proposals was to put forward comprehensive immigration reform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it met with the same fate, the last two dozen proposals for comprehensive immigration reform have faced, and that is death. It mm -hmm. went nowhere. Mm -hmm. Because, to your point, it, it has become a political football. People see the opportunity to create advantage by pointing to someone else's failure. I will also say, though, while the border and immigration could be a problem for Donald Trump, it also could, I mean, for Joe Biden, it also can be for Donald Trump because voters will be reminded, I presume, about how he proposed to handle the immigration crisis when he was president and all the images of children being locked up in cages. Americans are somewhere in between mm -hmm. the extremes and how the candidates are able to capture that middle will be an interesting thing as they play football with this issue. Mm -hmm. And to be I've heard you talk about that too, about the American, everyday Americans are somewhere in the middle, that they're not as polarized as we see sometimes in the national conversation. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, at the end of the day, Americans are tired, and I, and I, and I, I know I speak for the middle when I say that, okay, we want to be able to put our kids through schools, good schools. We want uh, the homeless crisis to be handled. And those things are not being done. And on top of that, we're seeing this crisis at the border. We're seeing them getting sent to all these different states and these communities and people are speaking out. And it's not something that can be quiet in, anymore like it used to be. And so I think that the benevolence of the American people has been taken advantage of and they want something done. And mm -hmm. so I, I think that, again, it goes back to those top issues that keep people up at night. And so Democrats are going to have a lot to uh, work on before November if they want to pull this off. You mentioned homelessness. Let's take a look again at Prop 1, because this is one of those things that would set aside billions of dollars to try and tackle uh, the homeless crisis, as well as mental health issues here in California. Prop 1, there you see it, $6 billion it calls for, and there you see 51% voting yes so far for Prop 1. Of course, still early on, but that's where we stand so far. Yes, and I believe we are getting some more results here for the Senate race. If we can pop that back up there, guys. I I think that we had that there. There we go. Here are the latest percentages of the results coming in so far for the U.S. Senate seat to fill the late Senator Dianne Feinstein's seat. We see Adam Schiff with more than a million votes coming in right now at 37 percent, and Steve Garvey, Republican opponent, at 30 percent, Katie Porter at 15, and Barbara Lee at 7 so far. And this is really a big race to watch. It's on the ballot twice. 27 other candidates are also gunning for this, speech, uh, this seat here, too. So I wonder, any, any thoughts on the updated results that we're seeing? I think these, uh, it is so early in the night. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that we've been tracking is where these votes are coming in from. Mm -hmm. And Los Angeles hasn't reported any votes. Mm -hmm. San Diego's reported very little votes. Sacramento's only at 12%. Santa Clara's still under 20%. There are a lot of, I would expect, based on the votes that are still out there to be collected, just and counted tonight. <laughs> Set aside the ones that we're going to count over the next few weeks. Right. But just the ballots that are out there tonight that are going to get counted, both of those Democrats are going to come up. Um, and it's going to be a lot tighter for yes. second place as the evening wears on. Right, and remember, this is not election day. This is election month here in California. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Uh -huh. I know people would love to, for it to be called the, at, you know, at the, you know, uh, around 10 tonight, but mm -hmm. it's not, it's election month. Yeah. And so I just want people to be aware of that when they're uh, thinking about, oh gosh, when are we gonna know, when are we gonna know? Takes time to count all those votes. Huh? It does, it oh. does. Okay, thanks so much for watching on ABC 10 Plus. Stick around because we're going to be back throughout the night tracking the latest results. We'll see you shortly.